Hi, everybody. It's David Nakayama. and Welcome to a very special episode of Power of X-Men. My guest tonight, or this morning, is an iconic comic book artist. You've undoubtedly seen his Hellfire Gala variant covers, his box art for Marvel Legends, most notably for the Age of Apocalypse wave. Today, his cover for He-Man Revelations was revealed, and perhaps most importantly, he did the DVD art for the X-Men animated series. It is with such extreme honor and pleasure we welcome David Nakayama to the podcast. Wow, with an introduction like that, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) David, you've broken the internet recently you know this right <laughs> with your I, <laughs> with try, your hellfire gala variant covers like thank you did you know you were gonna get that level of reaction for them no i i never do you know you you put your best foot forward you try to come up with the cleverest funnest sexiest whatever thing you can think of to make that cover as enticing as it will be or as it can be and you just hope you know and uh, the ones that pop surprise me sometimes and sometimes they don't but in this case i guess i had i had some hope right because the the idea of this gala is so interesting and different and unique and marvel never seen anything like this before it's just like a a fun excuse to have these cool looks and you know um explore different territory in the storyline i just had a feeling like that the event would be well received and so when they asked me do i want to do covers for it. Um, they actually offered me 12 of them. I, I couldn't possibly do 12, but I took as many as I possibly could, which is <laughs> six, which is a record. So uh, yeah, long story short, I, I, I was optimistic and fortunately the internet came through for me. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does the process for a variant cover work? Do you work directly with Marvel and they just mm-hmm. assign it to an account or does a seller like unknown comic book facilitate all of that? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's it's a relatively new thing, these retailer um, exclusive covers. By now, it's a familiar thing. You see artists announcing this or that retailer cover. But the way it comes about is Marvel makes a certain number of retailer exclusive slots available, you know, just puts it on the world and retailers will see what those are. And they'll say, hey, uh, I'd like I'd get in on that. Um, can I get fill in the blank favorite artist for it? Marvel will go sure that person's on our list we like them or uh okay we'll look into it if we don't know them whatever it is and if they can agree that this artist on this book for this price then (laughs) it's a deal (laughs) you know so uh that's that's how it happens and i i basically do these covers for the same i would if i was working direct with marvel i work with my very same editors that i would work with you know uh, under with other marvel projects and uh they do the communication with the store Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm also looking at your covers right now because my favorite is the Gene one because I love Gene. But yeah, you're right. Storm. Oh my God. Thanks, man. It's gorgeous. She looks like she's like just coming off of Vogue in this. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think you have to do your research, uh, not just for these covers, mm-hmm. but for all covers. But in particular, if you're going to try to do covers that evoke the sense of a high fashion magazine in, and in particular Vogue, which is the model for these. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't have a subscription to Vogue. I had to go and research <laughs> that. I had to go pour over the internet and, and, and look at hundreds and hundreds of Vogue covers and try to understand, well, what are they going for? What is Anna Winter trying to pick when she's <laughs> choosing these models and their poses and what's going to work for the X characters and the covers that I want to make? And I kind of, I figured out kind of a a rhythm after a while and and went with it for my six covers. Well, I love it. As someone who's a big fashion person, I thought you nailed them. That was great to hear. Thank you. That was like the first thing that was evident. I'm forgetting which one you revealed first. I think it may have been Emma that was, that hit first. But when the second I saw that, I went, oh my God. Like, I'm sure you heard (laughs) all of like, x-men instagram like squeal at them <laughs> yes awesome and you know, you know it, emma had to be first because i course. i'm making a little bit of a you know a little head cannon or something happened you know like i thought it would be really fun if you know emma had created this magazine and appointed herself <laughs> the editor of the magazine and picked her friends to be on the covers of all the rest of the magazines and possibly 
figured out the text that were on them. You know, like, I'm just sort of imagining for myself, what would that be? And that was how I, everything was informed just through the lens of what would Emma do? <laughs> I, first of all, I love that headcanon of yours. That is 100% endorsed by this podcast. <laughs> and, and, and you got it, man. I was even looking at the Psylocke cover when it came out, excuse me, Captain Britain cover when it came out. And I didn't like her look initially, but I liked it after seeing yours and like oh, the pose do, does I'm forgetting who designed it. Was it Russell Dodderman who designed her look? Do you get like a character model um, sent when, when you have a character in a specific look like that, do they send you a character model or do they just send you like shots? I'm just I curious because you got all the details. Thanks. Uh, you know, I saw the same thing you guys did, which is Dodderman's really great, you know, uh, catwalk, uh, red carpet walk uh, series of covers and his design variants. It was all, publicly released before I even started. Oh, really? And uh, so I, I kind of just like picked the outfits I thought were the coolest, you know, that <laughs> would, would would work for me. And uh, a lot of people said that about uh, Captain Britain, that it wasn't originally their favorite, but that they liked it a lot better or that I, I convinced them somehow uh, with the portrayal. But I liked it right away. I thought it was really different and cool and English. Yeah, so. it's very, I, I said this when we were looking at the looks, it's very vintage McQueen. And by vintage, I mean like early 2000s McQueen. It just something when I first saw it didn't really land. But then when I've seen it now in the Hellfire Gala and when I saw it on your rendition, I was like, yeah, that is totally Betsy. And I yeah. loved it. Um, was was there a reason that you only did the girls? Were the, were the fellas ever considered? Were you going to do like a GQ version of them, uh, you know, you know you we've come, yeah, I, it's not a personal decision necessarily. I liked a lot of the guys' looks. Like, I mean, mm. I, everybody loved Colossus. Am I right? Oh like, Colossus God, was a, a standout. Yeah, uh, a lot of people seemed to like Angel. Um, who else did pop? I mean, those two in particular. If I, if it yeah. had been up to me and I had more time, maybe that would be the case. But I think sometimes these decisions are made based on what does the retailer think they can sell. Yeah. And what do they think they can sell from me in particular? Maybe. I mean, I might have a reputation at this point for drawing, you know, maybe more than my fair share of the beautiful heroines, perhaps. <laughs> so if you're going to try to sell these, you know, these, these comics and, and, and do your best with it from a retailer perspective, that might be the, the main reason why they're saying, well, we should assign them all the girls, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. maybe, but people ask many times, like, would you be open to it? Absolutely. I'd be open to it. All it would take is Marvel saying, Hey, can you draw Gala Colossus for us? Yes. I You're would like, do that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And there was some fan art uh, circulating that was sort of homaging what you did. And I believe there was a Zaddy Colossus as we call him. And I thought it was yours <laughs> for a split second. I got so excited, but uh -huh. your, the, the, the covers you did, those varying covers, I mean, it was such a pleasure to see. And as they were hitting, it was so much fun. They were just circulating and people were like, oh my God, it's David's newest variant cover. So hey, that's great. It's really good to hear that. I, you know, like I, I sit in my, my studio by myself, by my computer. And I, I imagine that, you know, I hope these go well, uh, but you really don't know until they go out there and you're not necessarily there in the room where people are talking to their friends about something they saw that they really liked. And, and uh, it's really great to hear that that kind of conversation is happening. Okay. But you also broke the internet a second time with oh, your good. age of apocalypse wave two cover or not covers, excuse me, packaging art. Like, yeah. like how was it designed? I know you've done a lot of other work for Hasbro and you did wave one. So like, how was it doing though? Like, <sighs> age of apocalypse you know what i mean like and i want to phrase it in a way like i don't want to say it's like the best crossover but it's one of the most iconic crossovers how about that That's yeah, easily it. easily one of the top three most memorable definitely one that the fans carry close in their heart after all these years i mean there's a reason they're still making toys of it this many years later uh how many there have been many crossovers but not all of them pop to the to the level you know like yeah. house of m might be up there uh earth x was a big one for me I um, love but, Earth X. Right. Um, but yeah, Age of Apocalypse, there's something special. I think, you know, you had early Joe Mad doing those designs that everyone remembers and a lot of really hard turns on the characters that made them all very interesting. And, and I think um, sort of predicted their future path, even in the regular Marvel U, you know, like 
had we seen a savage uh kitty pride before that i don't i'm not sure if she had ever quite gone that way but she is now <laughs> you know like uh, yeah so uh, anyway it's um it's an honor to work on the stories you know, the, 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 the toys for stories that I care so deeply about. I mean, they, they always come to me with this tone, like, uh, we don't know if you're, you know, you got the time or if you're interested in this, do you want to do this? I'm like, really? Like, you're yes, like, I, yeah, want to I do. do <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> the rogue you did. And I want to know if it was intentional because I, I posted a shot by shot comparison. She's mm-hmm. sort of on the side holding her fist like that. Like she was yeah. in astonishing X-Men number four. Of did course. You, was that yeah. the purpose? Yeah, of course, man. Totally. Like, yeah. I saw that I and mean, screamed because like when I was a little kid and I was, I didn't read age of apocalypse in order because mm-hmm. Again, back in like the 90s, you did not have the gift of the internet, <laughs> knowing reading orders or going to your comic book store and them having the issues you wanted. But um, I saw that cover of her when I was on vacation and at the beach and I picked it up. I just stared at it and I loved it so much. It's great. It's iconic. And it's weird because like I remember that rogue pose so strongly. And when I went to look at it recently, I I realized there was a ton of other characters behind her that had (laughs) completely fallen out of my memory. I thought she was just standing there like alone on that cover. That's how powerful it was. (laughs) It was so great. And and the other character you drew that is one of my favorite characters was Nate Gray. Oh yeah. So you did him for wave one, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, I always liked him. I, I liked what Warren Ellis, I think I'm maybe alone or a rare case, but I really like Counter X and what Warren oh, Ellis did yeah. on there. Like the whole Shaman Nate Gray. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I don't know. They didn't go that, continue with it, but I liked it. <laughs> I liked it too until they killed him. <laughs> uh, true. Yeah. But I thought you just nailed his look. And I have like eight of those figures. So. <laughs> wow. Awesome. I know. I see behind you, you've got a nice selection, a very tastefully designed shelf. I, I, I hesitate to turn my camera. It's a mess back, back oh, here. Oh, <laughs> no. Worries. Well, it wasn't always like this. Because um, of the pandemic, we were able to move into a bigger apartment. And space is very limited in New York City. And I'm grateful I actually have like a geek study, you know, and I can actually do things now. And because the podcast has taken off in such a significant way, I was like, I think I should have like a background instead of just like boxes or like my bedroom. <laughs> Yeah. Good investment. <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've been designing for Hasbro for some time now. You've done Firestar, you've done Professor Axe, you've done Deadpool, you did the Deadpool wave. Who's been your favorite character to draw for that? Mm. Wow, that's really tough. I don't know. It's uh, it's it's always like the which of your children is your favorite kind of question. You know? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I, and- I don't know. You did the Alpha Flight box art too. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, that that one was unique because most of the time on the package, obviously, the art doesn't even appear on the front. It's usually on the side. Yeah. And more and more recently, it also appears on the back so you can see more of it. A lot of it is cropped into that very sort of tall vertical sh- space on the side of the package. But Alpha Flight was completely unique because it was a huge box and the entire front of the box, you know, a good, I don't know, like uh, two feet square yeah um is a full illustration of the whole team so completely different um for that reason alone it, it's one of the things that popped in my head when you asked like what's your favorite one you know like uh, it's it, i i love seeing the toy don't get me wrong i think that's a smart decision from a packaging point of view but it's also neat to see your art on the front of the package yeah so. no and it's a beautiful box I, they did a really remarkable job with it. And I hope that Alpha Flight fans were stoked. You know, well, to, to we that. absolutely <laughs> were. And I loved it so much. I have the box still stored away because I couldn't toss it. Like it was just so gorgeous. Your art was so kinetic and vibrant. Love hearing that. People say sometimes on the internet, like uh, I can't, uh, I can't get myself to throw away the package or I clip it off or whatever they do. And I, what, what, what more could you say? I mean, what could be nicer than that? Did you collect Marvel Legends before you started uh, drawing for Hasbro? Um, uh, not really in a big way. Like I, I even for some reason, like I, I'm not as uh, 
I'm not as good as you are with, you know, like the decoration of the office thing. I've mm-hmm. sort of been more in like survive deadline modes for, oh for a good God. 15 years. <laughs> so I haven't really put time into the beauty of this office uh, the way I should. Um, my plan is to have a nice shelf to display all these nice Hasbro products that I have now. And I, there, there's some up there and I got a couple of hot toys <laughs> and, you know, not, nothing major, but. I wasn't really like collecting much beside comics um, Mm -hmm. for many years. I love that. So how did you land the Hasbro gig? Did they come to you or do you pitch them? How does that work? It, it's a funny thing. Like uh, I gave a talk with the Savannah college of art and design recently. And obviously the thing students want to know most is how do you get work? Mm -hmm. Right. You're coming out of school. You want to know how to get work. And I said, well, there's this interesting double edged sword because, you know, when I was coming of age and trying to sell my skills, you'd have to go to a comic convention and you would have physical pages in an actual portfolio that you carried around. And you just prayed that you could get time with an editor, number one, and then prayed, secondly, that they would like the work and, you know, get back to you. Um, So there was this whole like travel around the country searching for editors thing that you did at that time. Um, but now it's completely different where you have, you know, the internet and you can just put your stuff on the internet. And if it's any good at all, people are going to find it like very quickly, like they need people to pencil these comics. Um, so if you're, if you're smart about it at all and you're talented, like you kind of just need to hang out your plank and people come to you. That's beautiful. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the downside of it is you're also now competing with the entire world's population of artists for the same work because the internet evens us evens everything out yeah um so i, I recommend it to, to to that group at least and i would to anybody else like uh you know putting your stuff out regularly on instagram and art station and especially being honest with yourself about how good the art actually is um those are the two things that are going to control whether the the uh the jobs come to you i think at this point so hasbro just saw your art out there and they were like we need this guy especially for <laughs> like our legends line <laughs> I think the way it happened was I had been doing a lot of Deadpool at the time. Um, I had Deadpool on the front of my art station page. I had just done a series of, you know, secret agent Deadpool covers that were fun and silly. And I think what they were looking for is, you know, uh, from a marketing perspective, you want that Deadpool line to, to just ooze humor and fun and, oh, you know, yeah. lightheartedness. And, and I think the way I was drawing Deadpool fit the bill. Uh, yeah. it, it's not serious. It's, it is fun. It's tongue in cheek. It's, it's a little uh, naughty. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's what they were looking for specifically a Deadpool artist, I think is, is what they wanted. And that's how I got started with them. So do you work with the Hasbro boys, Dwight, Ryan, and Dan? <laughs> not directly. I, I mostly work with a, an awesome editor uh, or designer, I should say, editor in comics, designer in toys, yeah. uh, uh, who, who's called uh, Ben Grimes. Most of my work has been with him. Oh, um, and I've gotten to know guys, you know, like uh, Dan and Ryan over the internet since, and we have a really nice uh, cordial relationship. And I would love to actually meet them in person one of these days oh. <laughs> uh, to, to say thanks for the cool opportunities, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> My God, every time they do a live stream, I feel like all of the internet is watching. And They're so good at their job. They oh make it God. really exciting and they get people like <laughs> on the edge yeah. of their seat. <laughs> well, we had Ryan Ting on the podcast a couple months ago nice. and he was so generous with his time. I mean, yeah. we probably spoke with him for about three hours. And wow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I th- I have so much curiosity about the process of mm-hmm. how legends are made and stuff like that, and all those like born like. So once it's announced, what's the lead time you get from the factory, and when do things start shipping? And he answered like David, much like you, just so enthusiastic, answered everything so meticulously and thoughtfully. You know, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the way he is on the internet, you know, he's 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 there every day, and he's got some new fun thing to share, and he keeps people engaged, and he you can tell he's like a super super fan. Like the way I I think you and I, I can tell you're a major fan. I can tell that about him too. <laughs> um, and that's that's who you want to be in charge of Hasbro Marvel Legends yes. figures. You know, the, the guys who totally know it inside and out, right? Yes. And I think also like the way, you know, just to bring it back to like your work, the way that they even released 
the Age of Apocalypse Wave 2 recently and your art. And I believe it was on Hasbro Pulse too. They mm -hmm. amplified it there. Like they just yeah. got it. They know what resonates with fans. And I just think that everything they do is a slam dunk, including your art on the wow. packaging. So, well, thank you. I, I was really honored that they would do that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to build my brand. I, you know, a long time ago when I was a teenager, I saw Jim Lee's art and I was like, well, that's what I want to do. <laughs> like, a, I want to be that guy. So I've been trying my entire life to, you know, reach something, you know, some fraction of that height. Uh, so when someone like a Hasbro will go out and, and share me and my brand and what I do with, with more potential fans that is worth gold, you know, to me, I can't thank them enough for that. <laughs> well, it's so fortuitous. You just mentioned Jim Lee, because I saw in another interview, you credited Jim Lee for X-Men one sparking your love for comics, as you just said. And I believe I'm trying to remember what the quote you said, I should have written it down, but you said something to the effect of you didn't think that comics could be drawn like that. Wow, your your research is impeccable. I, I have to, I've, I've internet stalked you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, that's how I really feel. Like I, you know, I had seen, I had seen Jack Kirby kind of stuff, and I had, I'd, I had an idea of what comics looked like, and it was fine, good, and I liked mm -hmm. it. But when I saw Jim Lee, it was just so much more than I was prepared for. You know, it's just yeah. it was so cool and modern energetic and i didn't even understand why it was so good until many years later and by the way i should say sidebar i fully appreciated jack kirby many years later I, oh yeah I, absolutely I, I learned why he's so great after the fact but uh it was jim lee at first that really sucked me in because it's just it just punches you in the face with how good it is uh and it just instantly turned me from like a kid who was interested in art into a person who wanted to be both a comic book reader for life and, and an artist like professionally from that moment on. What do you think Jim Lee does differently from other artists now that you're more of a seasoned mm -hmm. artist yourself? What do you think, what, what, what magic does he brew in those panels? It's, it's a whole bunch of things. Like it's, he's got this interesting stew of tricks that, uh, that, that all work collectively to make him who he is. And, so it's, it's the first thing that pops in my mind is the acting, you know, like he's so good of imagining what would the character be doing with their body language, with their facial expression. And uh, you just compare it to most other people and he just does much, much more, you know, to, to put yeah. you in the, in the mind of the character in any given panel. And it's panel after panel like that, like you are in, Involved and invested in a Jim Lee comic in a way that you would not be in most others. Um, on top of that, he's really good at, at lighting, which further gives you the sense of mood and emotion, you know, like he, yeah. he can drop blacks and shadows like very few others can. Um, so that really helps. He's also on top of everything else as if that wasn't enough. He draws like the sexiest girls in comics. So <laughs> he does. you know, when I, I was coming of age at that time. And when I saw the whole Psylocke business that was going on in X-Men, I'm like, what is happening here? You know, like this, uh, it, 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 it hit me right, in, right between the eyes. And I was, I was oh, very I intrigued. Oh my God. That scene where she licks the oil off of Cyclops's <laughs> face. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, oh, you know, Betsy. Chris, Chris Claremont in the early nineties was pretty <laughs> thirsty. <laughs> but I agree with you. And I think Jim Lee, that first issue, I don't think it, it wasn't my first issue, but obviously I had it and, you know, I inhaled it. I, I agree. I think the, the costumes were mm -hmm. phenomenal. Right. Um, the thing you were saying about lighting, man, like that's something that I never noticed until now. And mm. also I, I he imagines what the characters are going to do and that acting that you were talking about. And it's also just so cool. You know, yeah. like I just remember right. Jean, like having her like hand on like the edge of a door and looking and that's just giving a smirk. And yeah, know, these characters are cool. I mean, he captured exactly. the yeah. essence of cool for a generation of yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. He's he's set the bar. And the other thing that's amazing about him is like he's just gotten better and better as well. You know, yeah. like I you look at like the trajectory of most artists and people peak usually quicker and fall off the radar sooner. But I think he's still like as good or better than he's ever been. I agree. So, what the heck? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> have you have you ever met him? Um, not really. No, I mean, very briefly, you know, in the very early 90s, his studio did a tour through Hawaii here. And of course, I went to that. Of course, I did. You know, I was very, very excited about that. And so I was across from him. He signed some books for me. I said, thank you very much. I love your work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that was about it. So I can't say I've had a real meeting with him. I've, I've been fortunate to to sit next to other heroes of mine, you know, over the years, or sometimes even panel, I got to panel with J. Scott Campbell, for God's sake, one time. Oh, my God, that like, must have been so gnarly. Unbelievable. It was a gift. Uh, I think the world with him, he's, he's someone I, you know, who came a little later, he didn't even he hadn't, yeah. he wasn't working at that time. But Jim discovered him brought him into and homage, and whatever. And uh, yeah, so him and Adam Hughes became like, for many years, my favorites, and, and oh. still are. Those, those I've fortunately been able to talk to for a little bit more time, uh, but not Jim, not yet. Not so Jim, just not yet. It's funny. I met uh, J. Scott Campbell at a Comic Con at, at San Diego Comic Con maybe like five, seven years ago, and I was just like awe, like in awe, and I was starstruck, and I couldn't really say anything. Like no words came out of my mouth, and what I wanted to say was <laughs> like, "I love your art. Everything's so great." And instead, I I reference uh, Wild Sliders. I don't know if you remember, he did this like mini comic that yeah. it, I think just got randomly canceled or just didn't continue after like issue number three yeah i've got the ones that came out but i think it was just too time consuming you know yeah. like he put well, sometimes i find that the more you care about a comic or a thing a project of any yeah. kind the harder it is to do it'll take you 10 times longer to do the cover that you really care about you know it's your favorite character since you were a kid you feel like a lot is riding on it it's just it makes it way harder yeah. and Yet at the same time, this other thing that you're not so up in your head about, you can get done in a fraction of time, turns out better what's going on. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's unfair. But I, I feel like maybe Wildsiders for him, I, I'm, I don't know. I didn't ask him. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I get it. Like he put so much love and care into every panel on that thing. I can understand why it would be draining and difficult to continue, you know, at that level of quality. Yeah, which was that's hot, you know? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned X-Men one sort of being that, that the spark for the passion of, mm -hmm. of your comics. So, and I think you just said this too. So you were drawing before, obviously being an artist had already been something that was significantly a part of you. So was X-Men one, what just like funneled that towards comic books, or did you already have like a natural innate, uh, movement towards comics? That's a good question. Uh, I've asked other comic artists if if that had happened to them too. You know, like, where did you know you wanted to do art, and it was just a matter of figuring out what was the the, the you know the vector for mm -hmm. it. Uh, and almost all of them seem to say that. Like, I think when you're when you're an artist, like you kind of know it early, and you you are just kind of you have to draw. It's like part of you. You're you're going to do it, and it's just like looking for an outlet somewhere. And so at that time, I was just, you know, drawing 8-bit Nintendo video game stuff that I liked, or I was drawing Garfield or whatever little thing, you know, floated across my radar, I'd be into that for a little while. And then when I saw that, you know, that X-Men stuff, I'd seen comics, I had some comics, but it, it really turned a corner when that uncanny stuff. And by the way, it was actually uh, the end of Extinction Agenda. When I when I first oh. caught wind of that, my my uh, both my next door neighbors were were reading it, and I don't know why they thought to put it in front of me, but uh, I, that's that's where I saw it. <laughs> well, that was fortuitous that they did that. Yeah, I've told them since. Like you guys, <laughs> you guys changed my life, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're like it kind of worked out. <laughs> oh my god, that's that's just insane. Wait, I want to ask. So you're, you, you started reading at the end of Extinction Agenda and you've sort of been part uh, of a much larger comic book community since. Who is your favorite X-Man? Hmm, uh, that's impossible. And there's so many good ones. Um, 
Rogue and Emma jump right to the top of my list. Of I think oh, they're so I think great. They're great. They're perfect. I mean, like it's it's so funny. Like you can draw Rogue and it will be universal. Like yes, Rogue, because everyone loves Rogue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it, you are not lying. Everyone does love Rogue. It's true. And they were very, very smart in that first X-Men movie to focus the way they did on Rogue. And they should absolutely do that again. Although I really, really need someone to give Aurora her like, <laughs> like a real shot. Oh, I know. We were talking with the Lee Walds who created the X-Men animated series. Yeah. And they said their biggest regret is that they a wish they would have done more with Storm. Yeah. And then B, they had actually had read the original draft for X-Men the movie. And they were like, Storm has nothing to do. And nothing this. to do. And how? She, how? She always has nothing to do. It's, it's really weird in the X-Men movies how they spend a ton of time casting a, a great looking person who the suit looks cool and the powers look cool. And they have like two lines of dialogue. It happened with yeah. Psylocke. It happened with every version of Storm. I don't get that. Um, I, I love Wolverine and what they did with him. I, I liked Rogue in the first movie, um, but I feel like a lot of other characters were wasted. You know? Yeah, no, I agree. I even feel like I, I thought Rogue in the first movie playing that <laughs> POV character was awesome. I wish because we know now Anna Paquin can do sassy Southern after the True Blood series. I wish she would have grown into her role and would have, yeah. by the time we got into Days of Future Past, for example, right. would have gotten that sassy Southern Belle who's strong and just like, in, like so confident in her power, you know? Totally. Yeah, no, it, it could have been great. Uh, it was just a missed opportunity. But I have... I mean, come on, every single MCU movie so far has been extremely watchable. You oh, know, yeah. they're all good. Many of them are fucking awesome, if you don't mind my saying so. Oh, curse as uh, much as you want. <laughs> they, uh, they're not going to screw up X-Men. They're trying. I'm sure they're thinking real hard about like how to do it right. <laughs> I am. I mean, I'm so excited for it. I cannot believe we live in a world where the Fox rights reverted back to Disney or, you know, the Disney. Fox part. I know, yeah. man. And they don't like to throw hate or any shade towards any creators or any actors because you don't know what happens on set and stuff like that. But I feel like apocalypse and dark Phoenix just did not resonate with audiences. So I trust mm -hmm. Kevin Feige. I think he's going to give us the mutants in a very significant way. And I'm so excited to see it. And you know, what's also big on Disney plus right now is the X-Men animated series. I love that new people are discovering it. <laughs> and uh, you know, people who like little kids who have never seen it before, theoretically could be getting into this. So, but I mean, everyone I knew, you know, who's my age, definitely watched it was their favorite thing. It went on for a long time. They were all very high quality. And I love seeing, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 uh, the writers you were talking about a second ago, the showrunners and like the, the creators of that show yeah. are, are now certifiable stars in their own right and getting that credit that they so richly deserve. If they get their shot at bringing back more, I'd be all about that. Uh, you know, it's all, all love here. <laughs> um what was it like doing the D dvd cover art for them i mean you did uh, the quintessential team and yeah. then you did dark phoenix with like cable on it like i i can still see those dvds in my head i don't have them anymore i looked i looked everywhere uh, oh, yeah, but i remember fun, yeah. seeing them at best buy like <laughs> that's huge how did that how did that even happen I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I did not at <laughs> all deserve that job. I you it's, did. It's such you a, did because they would. They were amazing. You're so well. Good. Thank you for saying that. But I really did. You know, like I grew into that job because just pure love got me through that job. You know, okay. because it, let me let me paint a picture for you. Like um, I at that point when when they called me up. Uh, and asked if I wanted to do it. I, I didn't have like hardly any credits. You know, I had done some Top Cow stuff. I think I had some City of Heroes books that I had done. I think maybe like maybe some of my first Marvel stuff, but I'm not even sure about that had come out. And none of that is like if you if you think of my work now, I really doubt you would you would even recognize like what I was doing back. Not not only because there was a, some separate anchor colorist who came in and, and changed the look of it. But also, I just wasn't as good. 
you know, to be, to be totally honest, my stuff wasn't as good. I didn't know what I know now. Um, and uh, I don't know why you would pick me out of all the different possibilities out there. You could have gone to the person who's drawing, you know, X-Men at that time and asked them, and that would have been a logical choice. Uh, but I was nothing. I was, I was not a logical choice, but if you're going to offer it to me, my fandom was there. My love was yeah. there. I'm, I'm definitely saying yes. I would have done it for free. <laughs> you know, to be honest, you know, like, uh, and, and so here, here I am, like, I, I have this thing that's been put in my lap that I love dearly, but I'm, I know I'm not really good enough, you know, to, to do it. So the way I get around that is I drew it and redrew it. And I just kept working at it until I felt like it was good enough. And I, I feel like I pulled it off on the first one, less so with the other ones, but, uh, you know, I, it was the stuff, the quality of that work was so much higher than what I had achieved on anything else before, just because I cared like a lot, a whole lot about those coming out good. How long did it take you to create the covers? Uh, I don't know. Probably. If you remember. <laughs> I, it was a long time. I, I remember that it wasn't a linear process. It was yeah. like, I draw it and I'd redraw it. And I, and I, I wasn't going to settle for anything less than better than I'd ever done. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I had a baseline and I knew I'd have to exceed it if it was going to be good enough for an X-Men DVD cover. So I just tried to rise to the occasion is what I you, guess I'm trying, trying to say. You most certainly <laughs> did. I mean, the covers still stick. My husband and I, we we're, were huge X-Men animated series fans. And I remember getting those DVDs and him seeing Dark Phoenix like, oh my God, they put Dark Phoenix on the cover. And he just went nuts. So Yay, awesome. you succeeded, I, I promise. I, were they holographic at one point? Yeah, you want? I have it right here on my shelf. I'll oh, do you right want? Here. I'll see yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so here, here's here's what what you're remembering. There's a oh right there, yeah, right there. Silver silver foil thing that's on top of it. Oh, you know? man, yeah. They that's made it really. Gorgeous. They really shine. I and love. I, have, I happen to have. <laughs> <gasps> that's the the Dark Phoenix one. That's the one that I remember the most because when did these come out? The early two thousands, mid two thousands. Oh, I don't know. They don't have the signature or a. Uh, you know, a date stamp on it. So yeah, it's, uh, the art, the art looks dated to me, but I, I did my best. And at least that first one, I still think I stand by. <laughs> I don't, I, I disagree. Now I want to go on like eBay and like buy them. Cause that's, they look great. And, and, and I'm sorry, I want to circle back with what you were saying about the internet, having like an, an mm. even playing field. How did they even find you to do the covers? Because this is pre-internet being how it is. Did someone just call you up one day and they're like, hey, do you want to do the DVD covers for X-Men? And how does I, one take a call like that? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't a call. It was an email. So it might have been DeviantArt, you know, like I it might have been you. as simple as maybe the, uh, the designer in charge of the project Until like now. was just looking for comic artist on DeviantArt <laughs> maybe they found me though I, i'm really not sure no. <laughs> a, well i'm glad was, they found you i it has meant so much to my life that that happened you know like based on the strength of that other things followed like you know x-men 92 or this card set or you know that uh toy line or whatever it was like that that x-men credibility probably started with those dvd covers so it was a big big deal for me I spoke with X Men '92 writer Chris Sims recently. Ah, oh, wonderful! He's such a great guy, and he was praising all the art that was done for that series. That's wonderful. I would love to reconnect with him sometime. <laughs> He's great. Him and Jordan have Sailor Business, the podcast about Sailor Moon, and I'm a huge <laughs> Sailor Moon fan as well. Yes. So I've had I've had Jordan on as well, and they it's all good people. You know what I mean? Like it's just great people. I thought so too. I, I, I'm a big fan of Jordan. He was, he's been, uh, he was an assistant editor under Mark Paniccia when we first started. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were doing Marvel Adventures comic or, or something like yeah, that. It was. And 
I I've seen him go from there to, you know, Deadpool books and then now X-Men and he's just commanding X-Men, you know, like he's just so good at his job, you know, like the way he's cast the books and I know it's a team effort, but like, you know, you got to have a strong leader. And I really feel like Jordan is that guy, you know, he's been so good at uh, everything he's touched, but in particular now in X-Men, uh, I, I'm really invested in X-Men in a way I wasn't necessarily for other eras, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, what they've done, what they've ushered in is absolutely uncanny because <laughs> I feel like the entire internet is watching and it's just, it's great. And I, I know the, the Hickman pitch looked one way at a certain point and evolved into what it is now. And a lot of that credit goes to Jordan. It goes to Hickman himself, obviously, and all the other editors. And I believe like Jordan kept talking about Annalise, I believe there's an editor there mm -hmm. called Annalise. Yeah, his and assistant. He, he thinks the world of her. Well, they and... they do. I think she's like right there. Like it's the two of them, you know. Yeah. Uh, once I, I I had the good luck of uh, visiting the Marvel offices, and they have these tiny offices, and it's the two of them, the editor and the assistant editor, and they share mm -hmm. an office, and they they command their their stable of books, and. So I know how closely they work together, like literally like in a room. And, uh, you know, I know she's just as involved and, and working just as hard. Uh, uh, anyway, I have nothing but good things to say about this team. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, I, I used to work at Wizard Magazine. And Did you really? That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, back, back in the day. And I, love I know you won the Top Cow internship. No right? kidding. Wow. Yes, this is true. <laughs> How? And, and you had, did you have just graduate from the Qbert school? Did, how, what was the Joku, timeline? Like? Yeah, but yes, all true. And mm -hmm. you're, you're dead right about everything you just said. So the way it all happened was I was going to the Joe Qbert school. Um, Andy and Adam are Joe's kids mm -hmm. and they're both big X-Men, you know, comic superstars in their own right. Mm -hmm. Obviously um they were teachers at the time i had each of them um for one class or another uh in the two years that i was there and so you know i i had a degree i had a four-year college degree i wasn't quite ready to do comics which is my whole goal the whole time uh went through a couple years at the Kubert school and was really debating really hard should i do that third year or not and uh i got joe's i, I felt like joe had to give me permission <laughs> to, <laughs> So I, 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 I asked him for a meeting and he, he, he said, you should, you should go, you know, it's time for you to go. And I was like, wow, you know, I had so much respect for him. Um, he gave me that permission that I needed to go and, and try, you know, so uh, I had an internship with Top Cow, you know, uh, I got to learn with Mark Silvestri himself. This was a really big deal, obviously for me. Um, I had done a short story for a Dark Horse Star Wars comic at the time. So there were, there were little nibbles happening where I felt like I could maybe make a go of it. And um, so the, the way the Top Cow thing happened is I had been pounding the convention circuit with my hand-carried paper portfolio, <laughs> like I was talking about. And I got to know, um, you know, Matt, the editor, Matt Hawkins, the editor, their editor-in-chief uh, mm -hmm. figure. And um I think uh, it put me on his radar and it helped, you know, like to uh, solidify my win with, you know, there were pencil anchor and colorist slots. And I think that's probably helped me get the, the penciler win. So, yeah. Um, just to backpedal a little bit for our listeners who don't know about the Qbert school. I mean, I don't know mm. that much about it myself. How does oh, that sure. work? Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you apply? Do you, yeah. where's it located? It's uh, so I'm like, it's where the, is it? Is it here? <laughs> Well, I, I'm a perfect person to tell you. It's in a little town called Dover, New Jersey. It's okay. this little, little quiet uh, uh, town in, in kind of rural New Jersey. It's a very small town. And they have, they've taken over like an old high school building. I think it's, I, I heard that it was uh, shared after, after the fact. Maybe they only have half a building now, whatever. Um, it's, you know, they have, they have three, th a three-year program and you apply with samples, you know, and, uh, you know, it's a, you know, it requires a tuition, which is not insignificant. And, you know, in my first, in my first year, there were, I want to say there were about 20, maybe 30 at most kids in the class. Um, by the final year, it drops down a little bit lower. I think they, the graduating class is, is a smaller affair or was at that wow. time, uh, maybe 10 to 15. Why, um, why, like why that. is that just 
do do people just get burnt or i didn't bond? make it to i'm not sure I, I didn't make it to the third year i mean there is an expense to consider there's oh, maybe like there's there's reality setting in you know like maybe after a couple of years at, at comic book school maybe you're starting to understand how hard that actually is maybe you're starting to see the competition like even in your own class and you maybe the you know you're starting to understand okay well maybe i thought this would be a thing but i'm not progressing quickly enough maybe people are just kind of you know making you. yeah so for whatever reason like uh you know, the class gets smaller by the end, but you know what? They have a good track record. They've, they've graduated a lot of people who you've heard of over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm always very happy to identify myself with the school. <laughs> and, and do you live like on campus or? Yeah. yeah? Well, oh, at, that's the, cool. at the time they had a, a converted mansion was a dorm. And so uh, I want to say you're three- studying comic books at a converted mansion. That well, it's so it's a crazy. humble hum, a humble mansion, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't mean to say it was like lap of luxury at all. It was just yeah. like a bit, what I mean to say. It's a big enough building that you could have a certain number of kids in the class. But it was a great time. It was a really really memorable time. I met some lifelong friends there, and uh, you know, we have an RA, and it's it's a college thing, you know, like oh where you're God, just I in comic that. book school with a bunch of like minded people. It's great fun. <laughs> Mark Silvestri is one of my favorite artists as well. What was it like working with him? And I interviewed him when I was at Wizard. And I remember when I finished, I spoke with my editor, Brian Cunningham. And I was like, that guy's a really nice guy. And he was talking about like how the stormtrooper who dresses up as Elvis, which was back in like the early 2000s, he was here like, this is why I go to conventions. This is yeah. why I love our culture. That guy right there. And, oh, he's so cool. Yeah. And he's I, just... just such a great radiant soul. That's what my takeaway from him was. So I'm curious, how was it being his, you know, yeah. mentee? Right. Now it was, it was absolutely amazing. It was another one of those really unforgettable, memorable life experiences. Cause you know, he's, he's just so damn good. You know, yeah. like the, the quality speaks for itself. He's unbelievably awesome at what he does. He's truly legendary in comics. And what people forget sometimes is that he's also, uh, you, you look at his track record of who he picked to work with him in his studios, right? Like you got Michael freaking Turner, you had David yeah. Finch, you know, my class was Tyler Kirkham, Mike Choi, oh Eric Basildua, um, you are so talented. That is, I would, I would just fanboy if I saw all of you guys in a room just studying. Well, but remember, we're all nobodies, yeah. right? Like it's Mark going, well, that guy might be something. That guy might be something. And his eye for talent, I'm not saying for myself. I'm just going to mm-hmm. say like, you know, he, he's, he's looking at Tyler Kirkham's portfolio. And he's like, that guy, you know, like mm-hmm. it's just one after another. He brought so many superstars into comics in, personally. Like, I don't know if anyone has a better track record. He just had the eye. And then, or if it wasn't the eye, then he had the teaching skills to help that person get to the next level. Right. So when you're, when you're there in the studio with Mark, it was, it was funny because he would, he worked vampire hours. You know, he would, he would come in really late in the afternoon. We'd all stay up all night and we'd go to bed at like noon, something like that. And um, you, you obviously the point was to have time with the boss, you know, like you'd be working there and uh, once or twice a night, he'd make the rounds and he'd, he'd give critiques about, you know, everybody's work. Everyone would gather around, take notes and just try to learn, like absorb anything you could uh, from the master. And I think in that way, it's this super unusual thing that you don't even realize what a gift it is, but it's, it's a journeyman, like apprentice situation where you're almost in a medieval way. You're, you're there with, you know, the master and you're learning the trade (laughs) along the way, you know, Uh, when does that happen? You know, like for, for uh, there was art school for me and then there was this sort of apprentice thing. Uh, that's too strong a word. I was just one person in the studio, more like an intern, but um, still, you know, they're learning from a master in that kind of way. That was invaluable. And I don't know how else you would ever get that. You know, people rely on, on uh, video tutorials and stuff these yeah. days, but that's, it's, it's different than like being there day in and day out with someone who's going to track your evolution and, and call you out on things that, that you suck at and, and tell you how to get to that next place. 
How was it being an intern at Top Cow at the end? Like, what did you, I mean, you, you, you just mentioned about like Mark coming in and sort of gain time with him. Um, but like in the end, do you feel like you got a lot out of that experience? And, and I ask because I actually did get an internship with Top Cow back in oh, like nice. 2000 and like seven, something like that, but I couldn't move to LA and Renee Gerlings, Gerlings was, yeah. was the editor in chief at the time. And I always regretted it because I pictured yeah. exactly what you just said, where it's like working odd hours and Mark coming we, in. In a different world, we would have met each other back then. I think we would have oh. just crossed over toward the oh, end. That would have been, that would have <laughs> um, been really. Yeah. They don't have a bullpen anymore, but they did at the time. And yeah. Renee was the, the editor and, uh, uh, Jim McLaughlin from Wizard was oh, was there. He yeah. and it was editor in chief for for a good long time while I was there. Brought in a lot of new talent, new books. Um, had a lot, a lot of respect for Jim and what he does with Hero now as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was well? The question was, what was it like to work? Yeah, what at? was it like? Just like, yeah. in, what was your day to day responsibilities? Stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you know, at first there there wasn't any specific assignments, so it was like drawing pinups and and just kind of like trying things out and, and you would get critiques from the other guys. Um, uh, when I started, Eric Basel duo was like the senior. He'd been there a while. He's obviously really good at what he'd done. He did a lot of uh, help Mark on some background stuff like that. Learned directly from Mark for a long time. So he was a logical person to, you know, who was your own age, who could tell you some stuff when Mark wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And then obviously whatever Mark had to say, you know, was gold. Um, he just had this way of like, uh, he would just, he would zero in very quickly on what was the worst thing about the art and tell you, <laughs> you know, how you could fix it. You know, it wasn't just like, uh, there's a problem there. Well, here's what you got to do. So, you know, I came in drawing very bloopy, uh, soft, cartoony looking figures. And I think I was drawing Jackie Osticato one time. He's like, you know, uh, he doesn't look handsome enough, you know, like you should do <laughs> you should do this and that. And I'm like, what? And then the longer I thought about it, like, oh yeah, he's completely right. Yeah. I mean, and that was never not true. He was always right. And I was just a young idiot who didn't know what, what I was doing. <laughs> so to, to the extent that you can get off, get, you know, get out of your own head and realize that a goddamn master is telling you what to do, you can be successful in that situation. Well, I wouldn't call you a young idiot at all. I, I think maybe young Wayfarer because the Kubert School is in Jersey. Top Cow is in LA. Were you born and raised in Hawaii? <laughs> yeah. So, so you went from Hawaii and you did a four-year university. Was it in Hawaii or? Uh, St. Louis for four years, Jersey for two years, Culver City, California for what was it, two or three years maybe for top cow uh yeah it was it's been a weird journey (laughs) dude you chased that dream you hustled for that dream uh it's you know it's all i ever wanted to do i mean i i'm sure as a creative person you know doing what you're doing it's it you understand it's like there's you know what you want to do you're it's it's out there and so you're just trying to figure out what you can do to get there you know, yeah. it's climbing, climbing a mountain. <laughs> Dude, well, it paid off because like I said, like, I feel like every time you unveil a project, like the entire like internet is watching, like the Instagram, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. community just loves it. And like when you did He-Man today, listeners, his He-Man revelations cover was revealed by CBR. Was it? Yeah. I feel that was shared everywhere oh, of course everyone's so excited for the new series I, I am too uh i'll tell you a hilarious story that is very embarrassing if you want to hear it but of it'll course. prove my it'll prove my human he-man fandom okay so <laughs> here here for, not revealed anywhere else but here you go we got the exclusive uh, right here you do yes and i'll never live it down but uh, i'm a little kid i'm watching he-man in the 80s and um you know, I'm living and breathing it. Right. So one day I'm with my family at Chuck E. Cheese or something. And for some reason, there's a, there's a maze, little maze for kids, you know, made out of wooden boards and stuff. And it's very, it's very dark in there. And I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not successful. I'm like having a hard time finding my way out of this maze. So I stop and I think, well, gosh, what would He-Man do? (laughs) Right. Like, 
there's this there's this episode where he man is stuck in this labyrinth and he realizes that the secret the reason he can't get out is that there's an illusionary wall you see and he just has to figure out which one that is and then he charges through it and that's how he saves the day he gets the golden chalice or whatever and he saves the day so i'm back in reality i'm looking around and there's you know I can't, nothing's really popping out but there's this one wall with this sort of like crappy painted flower on and I thought well that's suspicious I mean that's that's <laughs> obviously the fake wall so I get a good running start and I plow head first into this thing oh my god <laughs> yeah and it absolutely didn't work <laughs> somehow I mean it should have but it didn't it should have but it and, didn't no and I learned a valuable lesson that day about <laughs> what's real <laughs> on television um <laughs> But I got a headache and I was calling for my mom and uh, <laughs> that was my He-Man story. What do you think that little boy who like charged into the wall wanting to be He-Man would have said about today and that cover being revealed and that revival? Like, I don't know. It's, it's amazing. Like one of the most fun things that happens to me is like I am at the end of the day just like a mega fan for yeah. all of this stuff. Like anything that was in my orbit when i was that age you know whether it was the comics or it's star wars or he-man or anything at all mm -hmm. i have infinite love for that stuff so as these things come back um and i'm offered a cover for this thing or that thing it's just so satisfying to to revisit or you know um reconnect with that thing that i've kind of always loved yeah. and so it, it's funny like the things i don't connect with are just the things that that weren't uh, in my radar. Like uh, I was offered a cover for uh, a certain anime that just wasn't playing in Hawaii. It's not something that I had. I didn't, never saw it. So I turned it down because I didn't, I didn't have that love that, that I have for most things uh, from that time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's so great that you're at a point now where you can pursue those passions. And I got to tell you, it comes across in everything you do. So uh, thank you. It means a lot to me. <laughs> so it's, it's getting early for me. It's getting late yeah. for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> before you go, can I ask you a few questions? And yes. I don't want to get you in any trouble. Okay. You can pass on any of these, but All I'm right. curious. So are you working on any Marvel Legends box art for figures that haven't yet been revealed? Yes. Okay. Do you think fans <laughs> are going to get really excited when they when the, they hear those absolutely there okay. there's a there are a couple things that are are complete and in the drawer and just waiting for that uh, that exciting reveal at one of dan orion's you know uh special <laughs> reveal days okay. i can't wait for you guys to see this and there's a new one that is on my um on my schedule this very month so okay okay i'll we'll have to wait and see say no more <laughs> One of the big uh, events happening in, in the X-Men this fall is Inferno. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see you do an Inferno cover? I don't know, but I really hope so. You know, I hope either, you know, I hope the X office would consider reaching out and doing some more work with me. I, like I said, I, I'm big, big fans of them personally and what they've done uh, with the books uh, but it's been a little while since we worked directly with the X office. So I would love to work with them. They're listening. Um, alternatively, there's, you know, there's the retailer channel as well. We do a lot of things, me and uh, unknown comics. And there's a, I think there's a better than even chance that they'll want to be involved with Inferno being okay. how <laughs> important that is. So I don't want to, you know, uh, assume, but that would be really great. What about any projects that you can talk about? Anything coming up that you want to share with our folks at home? Hmm. Let's see. Gosh, what is coming out? Uh, I don't know. You know, actually, it's funny because like a lot of the things that are coming out now are very recent. You know, I've just finished them, you know, just a, a matter of days ago. Um, and that's one thing I really like about comics, you know, as opposed to say video games or something where you're working on some for, for two years and then finally it comes out and you can talk about it. But like that Master of the Universe cover, I did that a week ago. And uh, Rogue that came out, uh, I did that uh, while I was on vacation last week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it's all very fresh and new. There's not a lot of like banked stuff that's like waiting to, to show because of that. Um, but there's definitely some, uh, some stuff, random things here and there that I'm excited about. Different Marvel covers. Oh, oh, and 
a new DC thing that yeah. I'm really, really psyched about. I, you know, I've spent my career uh, doing mostly Marvel stuff, yeah. but the fan in me, you know, like I was, I was just as much buying DC as Marvel comics all along the way. You know, I, I was there for Superman 75 and, you know, that's a, with my dad, you know, he took me for that, you know, the, during that period for those big books and it, it left a permanent mark and I've been a reader ever since. And so, you know, there's a, there's a Green Lantern, Jessica Cruz, Nestro Cores cover, yes. core cover that's coming out very soon. That's, that's, uh, that's a DC project I'm really excited about. And there's another one that's yet to be announced that I'm very excited about just another single cover that I think is, uh, I sure hope that it goes as well as Jessica Cruz because the uh, it's one of my favorite characters ever. So anyway, that's what I can say about it. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And and where can folks at home connect with you? Where can they follow you on social media? I'm really easy to find under my own name. All my you know social media are just at David Nakayama. So if you're on any of them at all, just search my name. Very easy to find me. David, it has been such a pleasure speaking to you. I, this is the perfect way for me to start my day. And uh, I'm just so going to carry here. your very infectious, wonderful energy with me. So thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to talk with you. I'm really honored to do it. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thanks for staying up late. <laughs> I sure appreciate it. <laughs> All right, listeners, as always, I'm the Uncanny Day Spring signing off.